everyone, it's Jack from CultTheHollywood.com and it's my favorite time of the week. No, that's weird. Hey everyone, it's Jack from CultTheHollywood.com and it's my favorite time of the week. That's right, it's time for wrestlers of the week. What a week it's been. I'm so excited to include one person in particular on this list. You will see in due course. But there's been a lot of newcomers to the list this week, which I think is down to the fact that, you know, New Japan's going through a bit of a lull during the whole Tag League thing. Raw is, Raw is Raw, you know. <laughs> that's the new slogan for Raw. Not Raw is War, Raw is Raw. But before we get on with the actual list itself, of course, let's first take a look, as we always do, at the honorable mentions. First of all, I must mention Zack Sabre Jr. because he... He's been putting in good performances in the New Japan Tag League recently, he honestly has. And I know that some of you out there are going to be like, he's just neglecting Zack because of he doesn't want him to catch Osprey. I, I think that would make for a more dramatic finale to the series. Of course I would like him to catch Osprey, but I can't realistically assign him points if I'm not too captivated by the matches he's being booked in. His performances are always really solid, he's a very, very consistent wrestler, of course he is. It's Zack Sabre bloody junior, but at the same time, there's only one thing that's really grabbing my attention in the World Tag League at the moment, and that is Chuck Taylor's storyline. Our second honorable mention goes to the Kentucky gentleman, Chuck Taylor, because he's just been turning heel, but not really. There's all these conspiracy theories that maybe he's the guy, like Jay White's mole in chaos, because there was a picture of him that went up not too long ago. And all of chaos stood there, all united and stuff. Everyone's going like, where chaos, Ray, at like the end of Street Fighter the movie, where they all go, mm. but Chuck Taylor's pose is that, which is Jay White's thing and he just did it sort of sneakily against his chest like that but somebody caught it and put a picture up so Chucky e. T watch what you're doing I think they might do a bait and switch and it's actually Beretta who's the mole but we'll see what happens also I'm waiting for a big AAW show to go up on their on-demand service but it hasn't yet but there were some fantastic matches so I've heard at that show but I can't give them points if it hasn't gone up already so what can we do right that's so everyone I got written down, I'm sure I'm forgetting some very deserving people, but let's get on with the list. Number 10. Now, rarely do I give points to anybody who hasn't actually wrestled, but I have done on a couple of occasions to Champa and to Becky Lynch in previous weeks, and this week, it's going to Daniel Bryan. That's right, Daniel Bryan picks up one point, despite not actually wrestling a match on SmackDown, because his promo was absolutely excellent. I love his heel character so much. Ross wrote a very good article about it on the website, revolving around Bryan's old veganism thing and why he should come up with a belt made of plants. So if that floats your boat, go and have a read of that. It's a little bit niche, I'll be honest, but I, I find it entertaining. Brian's such a good heel right now because not only has he changed his whole attitude towards the fans, his attitude towards wrestling itself, he's also changed his look. He's coming out in these easily hateable sort of flannel things and he's just looking like a bit of a mess. He looks like he hasn't washed his hair in a long time. It's really good stuff. I enjoyed when he said that he wants, he hopes his daughter grows up to kick loads of men in the balls because he's kicked AJ Styles in the ball. So good. So good from top to bottom. He did a guest commentary stint that was really good. I think there was footage of him after the show that emerged of him like being horrible to a little girl whose birthday it was. That's a bit far, D. Bry. Come on now. That's my boy D. Bry. But at the same time, when you do stuff like that, that's not my boy D. Bry. But yes, Daniel Bryan gets one point this week. And I just want to reiterate every time I give him points, I cannot believe that Daniel Bryan is getting points on wrestlers of the week. It's so good to have him back in the business. And I love the fact that he is the current WWE champion. Yes. Come on. <laughs> Gonna cry. Number nine, let's go to AAA now in Mexico and let's take a look at an event called Guerra de Titanes. I've butchered that pronunciation so much. I focus too much on getting the, the like the rolling R's and not enough on just generally the whole phrase, I suppose. Clash of the Titans is what it means in English. Uh, and number nine is one of the new champions from that event, Drago. I feel like we should pay our respects to Drago because he is the first literal dragon to make an appearance on Wrestlers of the Week, picking up two points. Very well done, Drago. Um, also, he's a great wrestler. He's getting on a bit. I think he's in his 40s, actually, which makes his agility and his speed and everything that much more astounding. Um, he won the AAA Latin American Championship from El Hijo de Fantasma at the event. El Hijo de Fantasma, of course, is better known as King Cuerno for those of us who watch Lucha Underground. He's really cool, one of my favorite guys, but he lost the title to Drago this week and Drago scoops the points. It's a merciless business here at Wrestlers of the Week. Put your jukes up. <laughs> I had an energy drink before this, so there might be a few little non sequiturs here and there. Drago did not win this title easily. He bled a lot. And it's often difficult for people in masks to bleed. He's not, it's not a mask, he's a real dragon, so it makes sense. But yeah, he bled a lot in pursuit of this title and did eventually win it, actually. So 
Very pleased for Drago. I think he's fantastic. I hope his career goes on and on, but I don't know if he'll be winding down anytime soon. Maybe, maybe not. They tend to go on a bit longer in Mexico wrestlers, I suppose, than in, than in the US or in the UK. Maybe. I'm not too certain. Anyway, yes, well done, Drago. I lent him my phone charger once backstage at a WCPW event too, and he was very polite about it. Asked me if I, asked me if I would lend him his phone charger, and, and I did, and he said thank you and everything. I'm starting to think, was it actually him? Because there were loads of luchadors backstage at that show, and they all had their masks off. But he was the shortest one, so I think, oh no. What have I done? Number eight, time to go north of the border because it was ICW's Fear I'm Loathing 11. That's my Scottish accent there. And number eight is Jackie Polo. Just justice, Jackie Polo. Jackie Polo has recently been doing this excellent heel gimmick, if you're unaware, where he's basically just justice, a Southern Texas sort of slick businessman type of like, well, I guess we're here at the Sportatorium. Really good at getting heat from like a working class Scottish crowd who just hate that sort of fake stuff, it's fantastic. He's deliberately using the fact that he's being a fake version of himself to get heat and it works so well, it's the perfect promotion for it. And I love it, he's recently been the ICW champion, but out of fear and loathing, he lost that title in a huge moment at the end of the show where everyone was very emotional to see him lose the belt to a beloved babyface in Lionheart. And honestly, every big moment for a babyface needs a great performance by a heel to back it up. And I think the Jackie Polo did a fantastic job. He's rapidly becoming one of my favorite heels, although recently he did drop the whole, well, I'm a Southern Cowboy. He dropped that kind of shtick recently because in the promo just before the event, uh, he dropped it and said, you'd never beaten Jackie Polo one day in your life, mate. That doesn't sound anything like him. Scottish accent. He reverted to his old persona, headbutted Lionheart, and then that sort of carried the angle into the match at Fear and Loathing. So, I don't know if he's going to keep the whole Just Justice thing up going forwards, but I really hope he does, because I really enjoy it. Anyway, three points for Jackie Polo, richly deserved. Number seven, another person from ICW, and another person who lost their title at ICW, and also one of my favourite women's wrestlers in the world, Viper. Viper is one of my favourite women's wrestlers in the world, and I'm very surprised. I think I checked, and she hasn't been in this series yet, which is really surprising to me. I think she's fantastic. I guess her most accessible matches, for those of you who've never seen her wrestle before, are probably, for the majority of people, probably her her exploits in the Mae Young Classic last year, where she was legitimately one of the best aspects of the tournament, but she displayed a very different side of herself at ICW's Fear and Loathing. ICW is a promotion that usually leans a bit more towards the hardcore side of things. I know the owner, Mark Dallas, is a huge fan of ECW back in the day, so for a hardcore thing to really stand out on an ICW show, it takes a little bit more than in most other promotions, and this match really did. Viper took part in, for my money, the best match of the night, I think, against Kaylee Ray, and also the bloodiest and most violent match of the night, too. The pair had a great no-DQ kind of brawl with barbed wire and blood and thumbtacks and that sort of thing, and to be fair, those things don't necessarily make for a great match. You still have to wrestle well, and the pair of them certainly did. Uh, Viper sadly lost her championship, if you're a fan of Viper, uh, but she went out on a high, in my opinion. There was that especially iconic moment, I think it'll live long in the memory of ICW fans, where she picked up a trash can, held it over Kaylee Ray, and just tipped out millions of thumbtacks, like so many thumbtacks. It was cool. It was like a river of them, like just a port, just sloshing about. Thumbtacks don't slosh. I'm being stupid. Viper wrestled really, really well and deserves her points this week. And I can't believe I haven't put her on this list before. Number six, a man that I will be totally honest with you, a man that I did not know really anything about before this week. Uh, UT, which obviously in medical world stands for urinary tract, as in urinary tract infection. UT, what am I, what am I talking about here? UT is a wrestler for Dragon Gate. And from what I can tell, from the research I've done, from the info I've gleaned, he seems to be a bit of a dick, which is great for a heel. You know, you want to hate them, and he seems quite hateable. Apparently, UT's story is one of unfulfilled potential, I suppose. He hasn't achieved as much as the other people in his training class in Dragon Gate, and now they're all a bit older. He's really feeling insecure about that, and he's taking it out on all the young boys in the promotion. Really like that. That's why, at the recent Dragon Gate event, he came up against the most promising newcomer to the Dragon Gate roster, Shin Skywalker, and they had an excellent, I think it was 30 minutes, 20 or 30 minute time limit draw, and it was really, really good. The best I've ever seen from UT. The first UT match I've ever seen as well, but... No, I... Still good, though. I can't dwell on UT for that long, just because I want to talk about his opponent next. So number five is Shun Skywalker. Shun Skywalker, let's let's ignore the silly name for a second. He's not part of the Star Wars universe. He's actually a masked wrestler from Bloody Dragon Gate. Uh, he is one of the most promising up and comers in the world of wrestling today and is so nimble, so quick and nimble, despite being a pretty tall guy, actually. Um, 
I think the match is, well, the match is available now, but if you want to see just a few little spots from it, head to Lariato's Twitter. He's done a few good gifts. There's one in particular where Shun Skywalker jumps from the canvas to the top rope into a huge springboard to the outside, just a casual standing springboard. Really, really good stuff. Um, the match was cool. I like that there wasn't a winner because having now researched UT, I think it's pretty cool, um, but also Shun Skywalker is too, and I don't think it was the right time to give either one a decisive win over the other. So why is booking there from Dragon Gate? I'm judging their booking, I don't know anything about this angle, but I think it was good, I assume it was good, and I enjoyed the match in full. So yeah, wasn't my favorite thing on the show, but we'll get to that later on. Number four, the new ICW champion, and in many people's eyes, a hero, and in many other people's eyes, a fanny. And for our American viewers, fanny does not mean bottom over here. No siree. That's right, Lionheart has been a point of sort of tweener contention for a lot of recent years in ICW, hence the dueling chant, Lionheart's a hero, Lionheart is a fanny. But now, he's like the biggest baby face in all of Scotland. Lionheart, as I mentioned earlier, defeated Just Justice Jackie Polo to win the ICW Championship. And I'll confess again, a little gap in my wrestling knowledge. I assumed, because he's been with the promotion for so long, that Lionheart would probably be in like his third or fourth reign as ICW Champion now. He's never won it before, which makes the moment all the more emotional, all the more better. And the fact that he defeated his long-term rival and nemesis, Jackie Polo, to do so, just makes the moment all the more sweet. The ending few moments of the match were really good as well. Jackie Polo tried to cheat, he got his signature mallet from ringside, went and hit Lionheart with it, but Lionheart super kicked it away, super kicked him in the face, love a super kick, and then hit a big frog splash to pick up the victory. Very good stuff from Lionheart. Hence his high placing in this week's Wrestlers of the Week. Um, I can't think of much more to say other than, I don't know where ICW go from here, and it'll be very interesting to see who feuds with Lionheart next, because that's always the mark, I think, of, of sensible booking and good storytelling. You've had your big emotional moment, but what happens next? How do you maintain that high? Is Lionheart gonna turn heel somewhere down the line? Is it gonna be a babyface versus babyface for you next? Is Jackie Polo gonna get a rematch? Or is it gonna be a totally new heel challenger as well? There's various avenues ICW can go down, and I really hope they make the most of it and capitalize on this momentum. Number three, another Dragon Gate dude, and the former Open the Dream Gate champion, Masato Yoshino. Now, Yoshino was the Open the Dream Gate champion, and for those who are wondering what the hell the Open the Dream Gate championship is, is, it's the top belt in Dragon Gate. Obviously, you never heard of the Open the Dream Gate Championship before. Yes, it sounds like it's from some kind of crazy anime, but no, it's not. It's a real belt and a very prestigious one over in Japan as well. I'd argue currently, maybe the biggest top belt in any promotion in Japan, other than obviously the IWGP Heavyweight Championship over in NJPW. Yoshino is seen as sort of a bright spark of Dragon Gate. He's a reliable wrestler. Very, very quick, one of the fastest wrestlers in the world. I googled how old he was, he's 38. I thought he was in his 20s or at least he was like 30 or whatever. But no, he's at a stage of his life and his career where he should really be showing down and he's showing absolutely no signs of that whatsoever. He's, uh, he's held the Open the Dreamgate Championship three times, I think, in recent years, each one helping to sort of drag the company through maybe down periods in their history. And now they've got a bit of momentum, he's very selflessly passed the belt on. Very sad for all of his fans and stuff, and it was a big baby face losing his title to a heel and everything, who I'll get onto in a second. Very happy times for me and all the lads here at Cultaholic, because the guy who beat him, we'll get on. We'll get onto that in a sec. But no, I think Yoshino really deserves his eight points this week. I watched this match, it was fantastic. He's so nimble and so agile. I'd love to see him in New Japan's junior division, but I think that's really just betraying my own sort of selfish interest as a wrestling fan. I'm sure that fans of Dragon Gate know that he's a valuable asset at the top of their roster, rather than being used, I guess, against some guys that I just personally want to see him against, like Osprey Skull, Takashi, if he gets back from injury, all right, Kushida, those sort of guys. So, no, I, I guess, on the whole, I'd prefer if he stayed in Dragon Gate, I guess. But it makes me feel all, ooh, all uneasy and dirty. Ooh. Number two, picking up nine big points this week, Kaylee Ray, the new ICW Women's Champion. Kaylee Ray, as I mentioned, defeated Viper to win a record-breaking third ICW Women's Championship. Nobody has held it more times than Kaylee Ray, and I can't think of too many better candidates other than maybe Viper herself to hold that title that many times. She's a wonderful wrestler, I think in last year's Mayhem Classic, she was eliminated in the first round, which really didn't do her justice because she's really, really good. And yeah, as I said, this was a brutal no DQ brawl. The finish was fantastic, where Kaylee Ray just grabbed a strand of barbed wire and held it across Viper's face and mouth as she pulled her in, it was like sort of a cross face type thing, forcing Viper to tap out. Now, 
That's a brutal finish, but I liked even more, just one little aspect of it, which was the fact that it wasn't a big comedy piece of barbed wire. It was one of those little thin ones you see in death matches sometimes. It looked really legit. Might have been a real piece of barbed wire. I don't know how crazy Viper is to say that, but she's a wrestler and wrestlers tend to not really care too much about pain. So yes, excited for Kaylee Ray to win the championship once again. Uh, I don't know where the belt's gonna go next. As I said with the Lionheart thing, there are various avenues for ICW to take heading into the future. But I would wager, I'm gonna say, this is probably gonna be a long reign for Kaylee Ray. No other woman on the roster, apart from Viper, has yet been built up enough to be a realistic challenger to Kaylee Ray. So I'm sure she'll have lots of fun heel antics. She's a great promo, especially as a heel. And yeah, can't wait to see what she does with it. Great stuff. And number one, what is going on? So, let's talk about Yoshino just a little while ago, saying that, oh, he lost the Open the Dreamgate Championship. How sad for him, oh no. But the guy who beat him is my wrestler of the week, and it's only Newcastle's own Pac, formerly known as WWE superstar Neville. But it's Pac now, it's Pac time. Sounds weird that, let's move on. The match was excellent, as I've said, but the best thing about this was Pac's dickish, heelish performance. He was absolutely bloody superb. I really enjoyed various aspects of this match, but one of my favorites was the start, because it got off to a jump start where one wrestler jumps the other to get an advantage and stuff. That can get a little bit hackneyed and cliched at times, but the way they did this was brilliant. No one expected it. Yoshino stood there, head down, really respecting the national anthem that's being played. And Park just gets this little smirk on his face and just charges across the ring and attacks him. And everyone just went, what are you doing, you horrible dick? And I was watching it going, yes, get in there, mate. The best thing about Park is that he doesn't sacrifice his heelish tendencies with his moveset. Like, yes, he'll hit high flying stuff and impressive stuff, but you still hate him and want him to lose. I wanted him to win, but you still hate him and want him to lose generally because he's really good at being a heel. He never stops snarling, being a dick. He never stops taunting and bullying his opponent. And it's fantastic. He's such a little arsehole. It's, it's so good. Uh, I believe he's wrestling a show in Newcastle soon. Cannot wait to go with that. And yeah, he won the Open the Dreamgate Championship, his first major title win since returning to the non-WWE scene from WWE. This was also really cool to see because Dragon Gate were the promotion that really helped Pac break onto the scene before he headed to WWE. It's where he almost sort of made his name outside of the UK to a wider audience. So that's really cool to see. It's his first reign with the title. I don't think he ever won it beforehand. And I just, I'm really excited to see what happens next. He is now legitimately one of the biggest indie stars in the world, even more so than he was when he first left WWE. He's gonna face Osprey in February 2019, I believe. So that'll be two, that'll be, you know, 10 points for one guy or the other, if this has another series. And yeah, I'm so excited. I, if we do Wrestlers of the Week uh, next year in 2019, he could win. He could actually be a favorite to win in year two. Who knows? I'm just throwing it out there. Let's leave who you think is gonna win in year two in the comment section down below. Do not just go, Osprey's clearly gonna win again. Shut up, mate. Who's gonna win next year? I'll go for Kota Ibushi. There we go. I've not gone for Osprey at all. Up yours. So that's it for my wrestlers of the week. Thank you very much for watching this video, but before I leave you, it's time to take a look at the old league table. Well, I don't really know what to say about the league table because as you can see, nothing has changed from last time around. I will say though, that I think at the end of the year, we're gonna publish the whole league table in full. I know lots of you have been asking for that on social media, and it would be just cruel to keep it from you really, wouldn't it? So we can have a look back at all of the wrestlers that have ever been on Wrestlers of the Week throughout the year. That'll be lovely, won't it? Um, yeah, there's only a few weeks left. It's really getting tight now. I think only Zack Sabre Jr. can realistically beat Osprey, but he has the advantage of not recovering from injury right now. Of course, Zack Sabre Jr. is still active as we go into the end of December, whereas Osprey is still recovering from injury. There is also one big New Japan show left on the calendar, so Zack really does have a bit more of a chance than you might think to scoop those 10 points and narrow the gap a little bit more towards the end of the year. It's all to play for, and we'll find out a little bit more next time. So yes, that has been Wrestlers of the Week. Thank you very much for watching. I've been Jack from If you want to, you can follow me on Twitter at Jack the Jobber. You can follow all of us at Cultaholic and check out our Patreon as well, patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic. And never forget, of course, if you haven't done so already, to bloody smash that subscribe button and to join us.